Welcome to this webinar series on biodiversity applications for airborne imaging systems. My name is Juan Torres Perez, and similar to other webinars, I am accompanied by Brittany Brodery, uh, Amber McCollum, and our newest member of the RSA team, Sativa Cruz. Now, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with our RSET program, we are part of the NASA's Capacity Building Program under uh, Applied Sciences, and are designed to the program. The RSET program is designed to empower the global community through remote sensing trainings, and we have a variety of training types uh, within these uh, four main application areas of air quality water resources and also uh, ecological conservation um, which is where our uh, team uh, resides our training levels are on the spectrum from introductory to intermediate and also advanced trainings um, with guides for remote sensing analysis and uh, this one is in particular is uh, more or less about on the intermediate type uh, level our trainings are designed for professionals within natural resource management agencies, uh, policy makers, and other environmental decision uh, makers as well. Now, for this uh, uh, webinar on biodiversity applications for airborne imaging systems, uh, it's going, there's going to be four different sessions of about an hour and a half each on today, March 27th, on the 29th, and then in April 3rd, and on also April 5th. And they will run from around uh, 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time, uh, U.S. Eastern Time. And as uh, similar to other webinars, each session will feature a lecture, and then at the end, we're gonna have a Q&A session where uh, the instructors will be online to answer your specific questions. And uh, as always, all the materials for uh, for this uh, webinar will, can be found in specifically in this uh, website that you have here. And if by any chance we are not uh, able to answer your particular question just because of the uh, limitations of time, you can always reach uh, reach us at our emails that you have here uh, on the screen. These are the prerequisites for this specific webinar. Uh, typically, we we have the fundamentals of remote sensing as uh, sensing as a prerequisite for all our webinars. And this one in particular, uh, since we're going to be highlighting several hyperspectral instruments, we also encourage our participants to first uh, watch the hyperspectral data for land and coastal systems webinar that we did some time ago, or uh, to have an equivalent experience in that matter. We'll, we're gonna have one homework assignment, which uh, it will be available as always at the end uh of session four or this of this webinar series so you, you will have to wait until april 5th to have access to the to the homework assignment um the answers will be submitted through a google form and you have until two weeks after the end of this webinar series uh, meaning that you have until april 19 to submit your homework and if you attended all four web live webinars and you completed the homework assignment by the deadline of April 19, eventually you will receive a certificate of completion uh, approximately two to three months after the completion of this specific webinar. And this is because of the amount of people that are actually connected with us today and that we expect to, to, to have connected with us through this whole webinar series. Here's the outline for, for this course. Today, we're gonna have an overview of hyperspectral uh, data from the um, visible to the shortwave infrared, uh, specifically from uh, imaging spectroscopy data. And then, so in part two, uh, we're gonna concentrate more on using thermal and LIDAR data for airborne campaigns, specifically 
two different instruments, uh, the Hades and Elvis. And uh, there's also going to be a small section session on uh, on one of the uh, upcoming campaigns, airborne campaigns from NASA called Bioscape uh, in South Africa. And in part three, we're going to be uh, showcasing some case studies that have used some of those these instruments specifically for monitoring terrestrial systems. And then we'll do the similar thing on part four, but more, more concentrating on our monitoring aquatic systems with some of these uh, instruments. Now, here are the learning objectives, and uh, we expect our, the, our attendees by the end of this training to be able to understand the applications of uh, hyperspectral data, multispectral data, to, as a comparison also, and uh, LIDAR data uh, for biodiversity uh, monitoring and analysis, and also thermal data, and compare case studies that have used some of these data sets in preparation, as I mentioned, for upcoming NASA, NASA satellite missions and airborne campaigns. So here's the agenda for today. We're gonna have an overview of hyperspectral visible to shortwave uh, infrared, imaging spectroscopy data, and then we will highlight uh, hyperspectral instruments for measuring and monitoring terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. In particular, AVRIS, the AVRIS uh, missions, and also uh, PRISM. And um, at the end, we're going to highlight upcoming mission developments, such as the surface biology and geology mission, and also the plankton aerosol cloud and ocean ecosystem, or PACE mission. And then after that, we will have our Q&A session. Okay, now before we go uh, into the specific details of some of the most used hyperspectral airborne instruments from NASA, let's first have a short overview of what is what is hyperspectral imaging uh, and spectroscopy. Now with hyperspectral remote sensing, we will be speaking mostly about the visible and the uh, infrared portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Surface reflectance at different parts of the spectrum or spectrum or wavelengths are used to identify various, various properties of the Earth's surface. And this variation in the reflectance of wavelengths is what allow us to differentiate features such as land cover types or water quality parameters. And here in this uh, schematic, you can see the sizes of different waveforms along the electromagnetic spectrum. And for optical remote sensing, we generally use wavelengths from the infrared to the visible range. So here, what I'm pointing at. And know that in the visible, the visible range in particular uh, comprehends only a very, very small section of the whole electromagnetic spectrum. Now here's a bit more simplified version of the previous diagram. Uh, now comparing the various, the size of the various wavelengths uh, to things that we are more familiarized with. So for example, uh, humans are, would be you know, are typically around one to two meters in height, which is somewhat equ equivalent to the size of uh, microwaves uh, to uh, maybe wider or, or bigger radio waves. Also note that the uh, visible range here is somewhat enhanced in this uh, feature, but it's still, as I mentioned in the previous slide, a very small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. So then, uh, what is hyperspectral remote sensing? Um, this is the acquisition of images in uh, usually hundreds of contiguous uh, register uh, spectral bands. Although most hyperspectral sensors measure hundreds, hundreds of wavelengths, uh, it is not the number of measured wavelengths that defines a sensor as hyperspectral. Rather, it is the narrowness and contiguous nature of these uh, measurements. Essentially, hyperspectral data is characterized by many bands 
and measuring reflectance at close intervals on the, on the electromagnetic spectrum to better characterize uh, spectral signatures and reflectance of land cover, water, and the atmosphere. And hyperspectral imagery uh, specifically refers to data capture uh, with bands that are usually spaced uh, about 10 nanometers or less from one another. Here's another figure um, comparing the multispectral imagery at the top here with uh, hyperspectral imagery in the, on the bottom figure here. And when we think of something like uh, Landsat, for instance, uh, there's about 11 different bands and three of them, or three to four of them in the vis visible portion of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. And in fact, uh, most, of, most of the satellite data, satellite-based optical data currently available to the public is in the form of uh, multispectral data. Now, when using multispectral data, and we look at the reflectance for each of, from each of their bands, we essentially only have three to four pieces of information as we're seeing here in this, uh, in this uh, graph. Um, but when we examine hyperspectral data, then we can have hundreds of bands within just the visible portion of the spectrum and also at other wavelengths. So we can obtain a much more detailed picture across the corresponding portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Notice how closely spaced the bands uh, of, uh, of a hyperspectral sensor are and the narrow bands here of the, of the hyperspectral sensors, sensor give us a lot more information to use. This can help this differentiate between subtle uh, differences um, on the ground surface that may not be available with, with multispectral multi data. However, hyperspectral data sources are currently very limited. Uh, several hyperspectral missions are ongoing are, uh, and are also in the planning uh, phases, but these data are not yet uh, as freely available over the same spatial scale as uh, multispectral data, which uh, and, uh, we will discuss in more detail a little bit later. Here on the left hand uh, graph here, uh, here's a data set that I collected uh, in situ a while ago with a, what's known as a field spectrohadiometer, and specifically the GER 1500, which collects data from around 290 to about uh, 1100 nanometers. Although we, what we're looking at here is, is only the visible portion uh, of that data. On the right hand side, it's the same data set, but adjusted to the four Landsat 8 operational LAN imager or OLI bands uh, of the visible range. And we can see that most, uh, most of the spectral features that appear here um, in, the, in this uh, hyperspectral data set on the left hand side to distinguish these, uh, these are reef components. Uh, Poriris astreoides is a, co is a coral. Palithoa is a zoanthid, which is a familiar of the corals also. Rhizophora is a Rhizophora mangler, a red mangrove. And Thalassia is a seagrass. And uh, you can see that a lot of these uh, different spectral features for, the, for these four benthic components of coral reefs in the Caribbean are uh, lost when you are looking at the multispectral uh, data here. Uh, now, obviously, this is just for uh, illustrative uh, purposes, but at least you can see how different the data might look like uh, when you look at hyperspectral but to multispectral data sets. And um, this, uh, I added these boxes here. These boxes represent uh, these uh, wavelengths. This, uh, 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 for instance, uh, uh, this one would be about 430 to uh, 450 nanometers, and this one is about from 450 to uh, 510, etc. And uh, and the purpose of this is so that you can see that, for instance, let's if you look uh, as an example, if you look at the green one here, which would represent the green band in the 
in Landsat 8, uh, you see that there's a lot of features here within the hyperspectral data, so all these bombs, uh, uh, et cetera, that are completely lost here. And, uh, um, and this could be uh, critical as, uh, for, for, for specifically for identifying uh, uh, these uh, different venting components. Uh, when using uh, remotely sensed data, kind of similarly, also you see that there's uh, there's no data that uh, at least uh, with the with the Landsat bands that is collected between around 590 and 640 nanometers, and um, and you can see that there's also a lot of uh, spectral features here, uh, specifically these peaks here, that are completely lost in the uh, in the multispectral data. So this gives you an ex uh, a sense of of how different uh, these uh, data sets can be. The Hyperion uh, hyperspectral sensor was on orbit uh, uh, on the uh, orbit on the uh, Earth observing one satellite from around the year 2000 to 2017. And uh, also, two there were two test missions. There are two test missions on board the International Space Station, the hyperspectral imager for the coastal ocean, or HICO, collected data from specific sites uh, from around uh, 2009 to around 2014. And currently, there's also the Ecosystem Spaceborne Thermal Radiometer Experiment on Space Station, or EcoStress which has been collecting data from 12 different climatic zones are and about and about uh, 25 Fluxnet sites over the continental US since around 2018. As for airborne hyperspectral in optical instruments uh, during this webinar series, as I mentioned, we'll concentrate, we will concentrate on AVERS and uh, also on the PRISM uh, instruments. And uh, for AVERS, we will cover, although we are more focused on AVERS NG, AVERS Next Generation, we will also mention the uh, what's known as uh, AVERS Classic uh, as well. OK, now let's talk a bit about applications for visible uh, uh, to the shortwave infrared data in the terrestrial and aquatic uh, environments. But before we go into that, here's a diagram that shows, again, part of the electromagnetic spectrum, but highlighting the regions where some of these common instruments uh, measure. Uh, we are also including here as a reference some multispectral missions like the, such as the Landsat and Sentinel and, and MODIS uh, missions as a reference. And uh, we can see that uh, Average NG, which uh, we will talk about in more detail in the next slides, uh, covers most of the visible to the uh, shortwave infrared, uh, infrared region. Whereas uh, PRISM, which is more designed for the uh, coastal areas and aquatic ecosystems, goes from about uh, the UV uh, to the uh, a little bit into the uh, infrared, and uh, and 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 the reasoning behind is is, is that it's a uh, it's aimed at collecting information from aquatic systems, including the the coastline. And uh, as we have uh, highlighted in previous uh, webinars, uh, there are big limitations on obtaining data from aquatic ecosystems uh, further into other regions of the spectrum, uh, specifically, you know, the shortwave infrared and others, uh, due to the absorption of the water molecules themselves. Now let's see, let's talk a little bit about applications for airborne visible to shortwave infrared data. And uh, this uh, uh, hyperspectral visible to shortwave infrared imaging spectroscopy data can be used to monitor and measure a wider range of some different environmental parameters, such as climate variability, land cover distribution, seasonal cycles, and, uh, among others. And uh, common sources for this data include Ibris and G, and PRISM, which are our main focus of uh, our two main uh, uh, sensors that we are highlighting today. But before we go into Avris NG, let's talk a little bit more into the uh, precursor of Avris NG, the uh, uh, Avris Classic. 
and uh, and the average stands for airborne visible infrared imaging spectrometer, and uh, average has flown in four different aircraft aircraft platforms, the NASA uh, ER2 jet that flies in a high altitudes around 65,000 feet. The Twin, Twin Otter International's uh, turboprop, scale composites Proteus, and the NASA's uh, WB57. Avres has flown in uh, North America, in Europe, and also in portions of South America, including Argentina. Uh, Avres Classic, as it's also known, collects data in 224 contiguous spectral bands with wavelengths um, going from about 400 to about 2,500 nanometers, and each band is about 10 nanometers in width. The main objective of the AVERS project was to identify, measure, and to monitor constituents of the Earth's surface and atmosphere over a variety of landscapes. And research with AVERS data is predominantly focused uh, on understanding processes related to the global environment and climate change. Avris is uh, optimally suited for the ER2 platform in particular, which, as I mentioned, flies at, a, at a high altitudes. And, uh, and Hamburg, but as I said, has also flown in, in other aircraft that, that fly much lower, such as the twin order aircraft that uh, typically flies around four kilometers above the ground, uh, ground level. And Avris has been active since around 1986. Now the pixel size and the, uh, and the swap width of the average data depend on the altitude from which data is uh, collected. When it is collected with the ER2 at uh, about 20 kilometers above the ground or, ground or 65,000 feet, uh, each pixel produced by the instrument covers an area of approximately 20 meters in diameter uh, on the ground with some overlap between pixels, uh, uh, yielding a ground swath of about 11 kilometers wide. Now, when collected by, uh, with the twin order uh, at a much lower altitude, each ground pixel can be around four meters square, and the uh, swath uh, is, is uh, much less, it's about only, uh, only about two kilometers wide. Now here on the left-hand side, uh, you see uh, an example of it. It's a two-color image from Key West, Florida, collected in November 19 of 1992. And the bands that were used to create this image were the red paint, the red band, 20, and the band 27 specifically, that's uh, uh, 646 nanometers. Um, the green plane band, which is uh, band 17, that it's uh, of uh, 547 nanometers, and the blue one, band seven, which is around 449 nanometers. Now, if you want to access uh, average classic data, uh, he are, uh, there's uh, there's data available from around 20, 2006 to 2000, 2021. 2021, and it's available to download from the Avris Data Portal, which is we have here the link uh, for your benefit. There are many filtering options, including the site, the dates, etc. And each uh, flight line uses a specific uh, base file name uh, prefix. Now, to access data be collected before 2006, then you do a, you have to do a request. You have to fill a, a form. Uh, to have access to that data. The advantages of these type of sites is that uh, with the maps, you have, you know, you can get into it and specifically see from where on the, on the planet the data has been collected with uh, Avris Classic and also with the other instruments as we will say later uh, during this presentation. The, the, when you download the, the Avris data, you can select uh, whether uh, you want a KML, JPEG, or that uh, data uh, data layer, and uh, and all of these are compatible with uh, with typical uh, uh, remote sensing analy analysis uh, 
software such as MB, QGIS, uh, some of the S3 products, uh, ArcGIS, ArcPro, uh, Arc Online, etc. And uh, also in this, uh, in the data portal, there's a, a pre-processing tutorial that is uh, provided for the benefit of the users. And again, here's uh, some of the previous campaigns from uh, 2006 to 2021. You see that there's a lot of data, the, uh, data collection that has been concentrated on the on the south uh, east of the U.S. and also on the along the eastern coast uh, or uh, eastern states, and also on the west, specifically in, the, in California. And there's also been some missions for average uh, for Hawaii. Now, um, Avris NG, uh, the objective of, of the of Avris uh, Next Generation was to support NASA science and applications by measuring spectra as images that uh, record the interaction with, of light with matter, as, uh, as with any other uh, uh, optical uh, sensor. And uh, Avris NG has flown uh, in the past uh, kind of similar to, to, to the Avris Classic, but, uh, but uh, in the ER2 and also the Twin Order Tumor Prop, but has also been flown in the B200 Kin Air and also in the uh, NASA's Gulfstream 3 and 5 uh, aircrafts. Um, in past missions, Avris NG has flown in North America and Europe and India and has been active since around 2009. Now, Avris NG has a much finer uh, spectral resolution than Avris Classic. Uh, it is uh, basically basically has a double the amount of spectral bands. Remember, Avris Classic had about 224 uh, spectral bands. NG has about uh, 481. And, and has a kind of a similar spectral coverage, about 380 nanometers to about uh, 2,500 nanometers. And because it has more contiguous uh, spectral bands, the spectral resolution is higher. In the case of Average, average Classic was about tw uh, 10 nanometers. In the case of Average NG, it's about five nanometers. So double the uh, spectral resolution. And here is, uh, we're just uh, showing what would be the typical pixel size for average NG based on the altitude uh, where it's, uh, it's been flown. That's sort of around 6,500 feet uh, above ground level. Uh, we will give you about uh, two meter pixel resolution, about 13,000 feet. Uh, will give you about four meter pixel resolution and then about 20,000 feet will be give, give you about six meter uh, pixel resolution. Now, once collected, uh, the data, the raw data, goes into a series of cleaning and resampling uh, processes to convert them into a level 1B type. That, uh, that is, that, that, uh, remember that 11, 1, 1B is resampled, calibrated data uh, in units of spectral radiance, as well as uh, observation geometry and also uh, illumination parameters. Now, then the data is goes into auto uh, rectification proce procedures that come into place, uh, as well as other corrections, including atmospheric and radiometric, radiometric uh, corrections, before the level two type uh, can become available. And here's uh, you see how it, how it looks the raw raw data, and eventually. Uh, the difference, you know, the, the big difference once it is uh, auto rectified. Now, this is similar to what we showed for Avris Classics uh, some moments ago. Avris NG has its own data portal, which uh, you have it here in the, on the screen. Um, they, it is, there's data available from 2014 to 2021. And similarly to in Avris Classic, there are many filtering options. Uh, each flight line has a specific uh, base uh, file name. And 
also similarly, you can download the data in uh, KML or JPEGs or or dot that uh, types. Now, um, now as a reminder, these are all from specific airborne campaigns. So therefore, study sites from where data are have been collected are are quite limited. And uh, and here is a map that shows uh, all the data sets available from average NG. Note that uh, considering that this is only from the past seven to uh, eight years, uh, you can say a lot that the average NG team has been pretty busy with uh, multiple campaigns per year uh, from the US and also uh, from uh, international sites. And speaking of that, here's a table that that is just showing the 2023 campaigns that are uh, where average NG data will uh, have been or will be collected. Uh, you can see that practically the whole year is already booked, and the fact that the instrument can fly on different aircrafts, uh, well, it makes it more versatile for mission planning uh, purposes. It also makes it a little bit more challenging as the instrument needs to be transferred uh, and integrated into different planes on a timely and efficient manner in order um, not to affect the data collection windows. And uh, most of the projects, projects and campaigns are planned specifically for some uh, times during the year based on the environmental conditions that are that happen during uh, during the uh, that specifically at the study sites here's a couple of examples on the application of uh, average ng data the upcoming bioscape campaign of which uh, you will hear more about in the next session on, on uh, wednesday um, it comprehends a lot of terrestrial sites, some inland lakes and also uh, coastal sites of the Cape region in South Africa. And also on the right hand side, um, we can see an overview of the uh, roughly 30,000 square kilometers of the average NG survey in the above uh, domain in 2017 overlaying on the National Snow and Ice Data Center perma permafrost uh, uh, classification that we're, uh, we're seeing here. The insert on the right-hand side here shows a uh, methane and husband uh, mapping of the Mackenzie data, the, the, the Mackenzie Delta uh, via uh, average NG. And uh, the darker areas that you see here, are open water regions such as ponds or lakes or rivers or, or streams. And the uh, brightened pixels in the insert represent the uh, enhanced uh, methane associated uh, with uh, specifically with wetland features. Now, in 20. <clears throat> In 2021, um, despite um, COVID challenges and extreme weather weather events, the uh, joint uh, NASA and the European Space Station uh, campaign was flown in Europe with the average NG uh, sensor. There were 366 flight lines that were collected on 25, uh, 26 flying, flying days. Uh, between May 20th and July, July 31st. Um, and here with this campaign, the University of Zurich helped with the exceptionally complex uh, flying logistics for, for this specific campaign. Now, despite COVID and the uh, challenging weather, the campaign was an extraordinary success with measurements acquired across site, different sites in Germany, Italy, Spain, France, Switzerland, Great Britain, and Romania. And a comprehensive set of concurrent in-situ calibration validation measurements were also collected by uh, the European teams. 
that the state-of-the-art imaging spectroscopy measurements and the in-situ data sets uh, are, the, are, being, are currently being used to demonstrate and validate science and application algorithms that are relevant to the upcoming missions of SPG and CHIME in the areas of ecosystems, geology, agriculture, soils, hazards, snow and ice, hydrology, etc. All measurements were calibrated to radi radiance and processed to surface reflectance and made available to the SBG and SHINE teams, as well as to the general science and applications community. Phase-based imaging spectro spectrometer measurements from DESI and, DESI and PRISMA were also collected simultaneously. And the images on the right here uh, are from the from other campaign from the Delta X campaign in the southern US, which among other aspects uh, used the average NG data to derive level three above ground biomass biomass from the Mississippi River Delta. <clears throat> Now, let's talk a little bit about PRISM. PRISM is the portable remote imaging spectrometer. And as I mentioned before, PRISM is mostly focused on the coastal ocean and has bands from around 250 to about uh, uh, 1,050 nanometers. PRISM has flown already in the ER2 twin order and the Gulf Streams uh, aircrafts and has flown in the Western uh, US, uh, South America, and also in the Southern Ocean. And PRISM has been active since around uh, 2012. Now, PRISM is a push broom imaging spectrometer with 246 uh, uh, spectral bands and usually has a spectral resolution uh, of about 3.5 nanometers. Um, and there's also two uh, shortwave infrared bands at uh, two, uh, 1,240 and 1,610 nanometers. And these ones, uh, this this bands has a, have a bound width of uh, 22 and 56 nanometers respectively. Now the spectral resolution of, of prism, similar to average classic or average NG, depends on the altitude of the plane speed, but it typically ranges from about uh, 0.3 to uh, 16 meters. Now here's, a, a, again, similar to, to what we saw in average NG, here's a, the different uh, product names and the, and the description of the product names, uh, similar to, to what we saw, level 1B and level 2. Level two is already autocorrected and atmospherically corrected uh, reflectance data, as well as a uh, water column vapor and an optical absorption path for 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 water and ice. And uh, and here's some examples of uh, data products that are available level uh, the level one B or level two for the for specific sites uh, in Florida and in. California uh, in this case and you can see you can you can download a quick look or you can download a whole data set uh, depending on the capability of your system now uh, again similar to average uh, classic orng prism has its own data portal where researchers can can download the data from here's a link for it Again, very similar to what we saw for average or classic or NG. The data types are also similar, and the data is compatible with uh, typical uh, uh, analysis software for remote sensing data. Yeah, the, there's a map on the website uh, where you can see specifically from where and when the data is available. And here's a, an enhanced version of the map that it shows uh, the 2012 to 2018 campaigns uh, on the west coast of the US and also in, in South America and even close to, to Antarctica. Here's some of the, some of the PRISM uh, biodiversity applications. Um, uh, PRISM will also be flown during the Bioscape campaign later this year. 
And PRISM uh, was also flown in a very uh, important NASA campaign, which was a coral of the older Coral Reef Airborne Laboratory mission, uh, during which PRISM was flown over diverse coral reef sites in the Pacific. And we will talk more about uh, the coral mission in session four uh, of this webinar series. So here's another example of applying PRISM data, uh, in this case for monitoring water quality in the San Francisco Bay Delta uh, estuary uh, watershed, which is a major source of fresh water for this part of California, uh, despite it uh, being uh, heavily impacted by humans. So water quality monitoring is critical for this type of environment. And here PRISM was flown is in a twin order airplane at low altitudes, which allowed of obtaining uh, hyperspectral data uh, at very high spatial resolutions, in this case of about uh, 2.6 uh, uh, by 2.6 pixel size. And with the data, the team uh, derived the distributions of uh, turbidity, dissolved organic carbon, and chlorophyll A, which is, um, you've seen an example of it right here on the, right hand, on the left hand side. Um, further, with the dissolved organic carbon data, they were able to estimate concentrations of, uh, of methyl mercury at the water surface uh, also. And here's uh, the link to the paper of Fichora Law in 2016, where you can find uh, much more information about this specific campaign that was flown uh, in the San Francisco Bay Delta. Now, uh, we wanted to compare the, as a kind of as a summary of what we have shown already, compare the three different instruments, the Average Classic, Average NG, and PRISM. Average Classic has been active uh, since uh, 1986, and Average NG since 2009, and PRISM since 2012. Um, Average has a, has a 224 contiguous band, that cover the spectral range uh, between 380 and 2,500 nanometers at a spectral resolution of 10 nanometers. And again, depending on the altitude, a spatial resolution of anywhere between four and 20 meters. Average NG has 481 contiguous bands that cover a similar spectral range as the average classic, but has a much higher spectral resolution of about five nanometers and a higher spatial resolution as well two to six meters and prism has a 256 uh, spectral bands and two uh, bands in the uh, shortwave infrared and uh, has a spectral coverage of around 350 to about a thousand nanometers uh, 3.5 uh, nanometers of spectral resolution and the spatial resolution again depending on the altitude that is flown is anywhere between 0.3 to about 16 nanometers Um, all of these three instruments have their own data portal where, you, where users can download the, their data. Um, again, for Average Classic, if you're looking for data that was collected before 2006, there's a, you have to request that data. There's a form that uh, potential users can uh, fill and uh, eventually they will be uh, contacted. For, for accessing the data. Um, the, in terms of data products for, uh, for, for Average Classic, uh, up to level 1B for 1993 to 2012, and up to level two for data collected from 2013 to the present. And in case of NG and PRISM, their, the data products are available from both level 1B and level two uh, <coughs> for the users. And data types are similar, as we mentioned in the uh, in the previous slides. You can you can request it as a KML, JPEG, or TAP. Now, I wanted to mention the that the Earth uh, Observing System Data and Information System, or ELSDIS uh, Enterprise Architecture 
was developed in the 1990s and relies on distributed nodes, what are, what are known as the R of the DAX, or the Distributed Active Arch Archive Centers, uh, to most uh, effectively and efficiently serve the science uh, user community. And these DAGs are managed by the Earth Science Data and Information System, or ESDIS project, which is responsible for the EOSDIS uh, science systems. The design not only spreads the load across many different systems, but it also allows individual DAGs to customize services to meet the needs of the specific science disciplines that they serve, which include atmosphere, uh, calibrated radiance and solar radiance, cryosphere, human dimensions, land and ocean. In addition, by adopting a system using many DAGs to archive and distribute data, NASA ensures that the system can easily scale to meet the growing production of uh, science data and handle future missions that will generate uh, greater quantities of data. And you can see here in this map all the different DAGs. Well, where are they located? Uh, which is not uh, really that imp uh, much important. The importance here is that uh, you can see that for each of them, what are the different themes that they specialize in? So for instance, the physical oceanography DAG uh, has data on gravity, sea surface temperature, ocean winds, topography, circulation, currents, land processes DAG or LP DAG, also land cover, surface reflectance, radiance, temperature, topography, etc as well as the Oak Ridge uh, one, which is more on uh, biogeochemical dynamics and ecological uh, data and environmental processes. And uh, we encourage you go, to go to the uh, NASA uh, Earth Data uh, website and, uh, and specifically look for uh, each of these uh, uh, distributed al uh, active archive centers. Uh, if you if you are more interested in specific types of data from from airborne campaigns now let's mention briefly some uh, upcoming nasa led uh, satellite missions with uh, with hyperspectral capabilities and again um the uh, these missions uh, the 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 airborne campaigns usually serve to pave the way for future missions. And the design and, and data from these airborne uh, instruments are essential in the development of upcoming satellite missions, such as the ones that we will mention um, in the next slides. And mission objectives and spectrometer spe uh, specifications are based off of the successful implementation of some of these airborne campaigns. And here's some data that has been collected with uh, HIRIS, IPOS NG, IPOS Classic, and PRISM, and that were uh, have been used uh, specifically for the development of the of the upcoming uh, surface biology and geology mission. Here's a paper where a lot of us uh, participated in from from Cosi Nicholson et al. in 2021. And here's a link uh, to access it where there's a lot of information about Abris NG, the specifications of Abris NG uh, in particular. Now, there are a few uh, upcoming NASA hyperspectral missions that will benefit the various uh, previous, uh, from, the, from the previous uh, airborne campaigns. The first one is the uh, Plankton Aerosol Cloud and Ocean Ecosystem, or PACE mission, which will focus on global oceans, the atmosphere, and terrestrial systems. It's still in development, um, but will be uh, designed to take data in the ultra, from the ultraviolet to the shortwave infrared regions of the spectrum with bands at approximately uh, 2.5 nanometer uh, of resolution. Then there's a surface biology and geology mission, which has many application areas of focus. Uh, prior to the planning of SBG under the directive of the Decadal Survey, the hyperspectral infrared 
imager or a Hesperia mission concept activity occurred from 2007 to 2018 with different flights in Hawaii and California for uh, 13 different mission concept uh, projects. This concept work was also vital to the development of, of the technology of EcoStress on board the uh, International Space Station. And his period campaigns demonstrated the feasibility of applications of these uh, data for things like global terrestrial ecosystem composition and function, fires, agriculture, and many others. And the primary focus now is on the development of SBG or cephal biology and geology uh, with this knowledge base. Now, the final upcoming hyperspectral mission that I wanted to mention is also the geosynchronous littoral imaging and monitoring radiometer or GLIMMER. This is a mission like EcoStress. Uh, this mission like EcoStress has been approved as part of the NASA's uh, Earth, Venture, Earth Venture Instrument uh, or EVI portfolio, which are small targeted science investigations that complement NASA's larger Earth observing satellite missions. The initiative was led by the uh, principal investigator, uh, Joseph Salisbury at the University of New Hampshire and Durham. And Glimmer will focus on providing unique observations of ocean biology, chemistry, and ecology of the Gulf of Mexico, portions of the southeastern US uh, coastline, and also the Amazon River Plume. Now, PACE, as I said, is the Plankton Aerosol Cloud and Ocean uh, uh, Ecosystem Mission. Uh, it's uh, the NASA's most advanced global ocean color and aerosol mission to date. When it launches around January of uh, 2024, 2024, next year, uh, the PACE Observatory will have three different instruments. The first one is a hyperspectral scanning radiometer, referred to as the Ocean Color Instrument, or OC. OC is uh, going to provide continuous spectral resolution from the ultraviolet to the visible into the near infrared of the spectrum. And there are also seven shortwave infrared channels, which are useful for atmospheric science as well as for coastal oceanographic science. There are two uh, contributed multi angle polarimeters. The first polarimeter is called HARP2 which is a contribution from the University of uh, Maryland, uh, Baltimore County. The second is uh, SPEX-1, um, which is uh, contributed from a consortium of organizations in the Netherlands. And HARP-2 and SPEX-1 SPEX will be uh, collecting global aerosol and cloud properties too. Uh, these aerosols and cloud properties or atmospheric characterization will also help make our uh, ocean data more reliable and detailed than it has ever been before. The inclusion of the multi-angle uh, polarimeters in the in the mission has elevated paced capabilities for global aerosol characterizations at new uh, completely new levels. The multi-angle polarimeters, uh, with its enhanced uh, information content, provides the opportunity for simultaneous retrievals of aerosols and for surface properties. Now, um, total light versus polarized lights also allows for new colors of information. Now, together with the uh, with the multi-angle polarized uh, observations of Spex ones and HARP two, will complement the wide swath and high spatial resolution of OSI. PACE is going to extend um, uh, ocean biological, ecological, and biogeochemical data records, as well as cloud and aerosol data records. It will also make new global measurements of ocean color that are essential for understanding the global carbon cycle and ocean ecosystem responses to, to a changing climate. Finally, PACE will collect global observations of aerosol and cloud properties focusing on reducing the largest uncertainties in climate and radi radiative forcing models. Now, here's this slide is just a summary of the synergies that, uh, that the combination of multi-angle polarimeters and the ocean color instrument uh, provide. 
opportunities for aerosol characterization, improved um, uh, atmospheric correction, identification of different algal groups, uh, correction for sun glint also, and new data products, among other benefits, uh, benefits and synergies. Now with PACE, we'll be developing global daily hyperspectral measurements for ocean color essential for understanding the global carbon cycle and ocean ecosystem, including its responses to a changing climate. But since we have the polarimeters, we will also be collecting global aerosol and cloud properties too, which, uh, like I said, will reduce this uh, the, the, some of the uncertainties that we have right now in uh, radiative uh, forcing models. Now, we will definitely be improving, improving our understanding of how aerosols influence uh, ocean ecosystems and how ocean biological and photochemical processes affect the atmosphere uh, and how this impacts, impacts us as a society as well. Now, PACE uh, makes uh, a quantum leap in moving from uh, multispectral radiometry to spectroscopy, uh, in which we were looking at a contiguous, contiguous uh, gradient uh, of the of the colors of the rainbow, and not not just you know just just cherry pick bands. Uh, this gives us more information that we currently have in our toolbox to get a, let's say, things like phytoplankton community composition or to separate phytoplankton from other water column constituents. But beyond phytoplankton, we can also see suspended materials um, for looking at things like turbidity, light penetration, terrestrial inversions, and other things. And therefore, we can better characterize aquatic ecosystems by uh, with, you know, using things like visibility and water cl clarity. Now, on the right-hand figures here, we are uh, we are comparing the uh, how the occurrence of two distinct types of uh, of uh, plankton communities can be distinguished better with with pace in this case. Uh, in this case, we're looking at diatoms and also noctiluca, which is a dinoflagellate. Noctiluca is uh, increasing in the, and here's some, uh, specifically the data that I'm talking about. Noctiluca is increasing in the Arabian Sea and are competing diatoms in the environment, causing an, an ecosystem shift. Noct noctiluca consumes diatoms and the rise of noctiluca blooms can be tied with changing wind patterns and warming that changes in ocean circulation patterns. Now, increased heat, slower wind, and decreased mixing in the upper ocean uh, don't get delivered. In the, don't get the delivery of nutrients, uh, rich waters on the top of the oceans. The diatoms die off, and octiluca grows faster. But so plankton can eat them. Jellyfish can eat them, so they start blooming. And fishes eat diatoms, so when the diatoms uh, decrease and oxygen levels go down, then the fishes and fish kills can occur. Can occur, and here's a uh, what uh, a comparison of what virus, the, uh, uh, which is currently in, in orbit, uh, sees. Different, there's just uh, you know several points uh, within the, the 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 visible spectrum, and uh, how different it looks like of, uh, in terms of what will pace will eventually see uh, also um, and how how uh, easy will potentially be to separate these two types of, uh, of uh, uh, water column components, uh, diatoms and noctiluca based on the spectral signature from the water column as, as it will be obtained by pace. Now, given the system of systems approach of PACE and the wide ranging, ranging data that PACE will offer for water resources, climate and air, air quality and atmospheric applications, it is obvious that it will contribute um, to NASA's applied science objectives. Just a few here are noted uh, related to water quality, 
and water resources. And base data uh, will enable applications across fisheries, health from algal blooms, and across uh, human health areas, air quality, disasters, and uh, eco forecasting, among, among many other applications. Now, PACE data will inform several uh, relevant application areas covering atmospheric, marine, and terrestrial areas. And um, for the purpose of, of this training in particular, um, here we, we can see uh, some of these uh, marine and terrestrial ecosystems uh, <clears throat> in this uh, specific slide. Uh, perhaps, perhaps the most important for marine ecosystems, uh, PAID will provide phytoplankton community composition data that will enable us to recognize different phytoplankton species and types, as uh, as we saw in the previous slide. And this is going to help fisheries support fisheries and aqu aquaculture industries underst understanding phytoplankton types. That uh, because of the understanding of the phytoplankton types helps with locating aquaculture sites and also understanding marine food webs, including uh, even marine mammal feeding zones. That aquatic biodiversity is essential for maintaining a healthy ecosystem as well. We don't always see that the ocean has a um, different ecosystem, it's a huge diversity of life, starting with phytoplankton and satellites like space will help us understand that ecosystem so that we can understand how it impacts the broader ocean ecosystem and even the climate. Now, one uh, PACE early adopter is uh, in South Africa and will use uh, hyperspectral uh, PACE data to monitor half algal blooms. The South African west and south coast suffer from the frequent occurrence of uh, algal blooms, and these blooms can have considerable ne negative impacts on commercial marine industries and aqu aquaculture operations, in addition to local marine ecosystems and communities. The South African marine aquaculture se sector centers around the Musel uh, Mytilus, the Pacific oyster Casostrea, Gigs, and the abalone alotis uh, farming, with most facilities situated around the west coast in close proximity to the productive uh, Benguela current upwelling system. Now, algal blooms, half from algal blooms impacts uh, come about through either the toxicity to humans and other animals of some bloom species, uh, reptiles, or the collapse of high biomass blooms through uh, nutrient exhaustion, leading in extreme cases to hypoxia and dramatic mortalities of marine organisms. Plankton will then in enable the identification and evaluation of uh, half algal bloom threats, examine sensibility to the uh, detailed size based uh, phytoplankton functional types discrimination, and inform the limits of phytoplankton identification from satellite radiometry. This will support public health decision making, small scale fisheries, and also marine biodiversity conservation. Now, PACE will also help inform the management of terrestrial ecosystems, offering data on surface vegetation, including parameters like surface reflectance. Um, Bidirect, bidirection and reflectance distributing function, or uh, BRDF, and normalize different vegetation indices like NDVI. Um, having these the data products will give us uh, valuable insights into wetland, ecosystem health, forest health, ag agriculture, and ultimately how processes on land may impact coastal ecosystems. For example, one early adopter of PACE data is using OSI uh, spectral data to advance vegetation indices and estimate the associated uh, fractional canopy cover, leaf area, area index, and also roughness uh, length. And PACE will provide high resolution spectral information in the ultraviolet and near infrared regions as compared to the current and legacy satellite instruments. This capability of PACE will enhance uh, existing vegetation parameterizations 
relative to the existing data products provided by uh, currently by Modis or Beers. And the enhanced parameterization, parameterizations will lead to improved uh, land surface and hydrological modeling, uh, particularly uh, surface fluxes, which will further our understanding of wetland ecosystems, health, and structure. Now, PACE uh, data will support, support five of NASA's applied science research areas, including monitoring aquatic uh, um, air quality and health, uh, water resources, climate, ecological forecasting, conservation, and disaster. PACE will support air quality uh, forecasting and monitoring efforts to assess the effects that air pollutants, such as aerosols, particulate matter, and volcanic ash, have on public health, uh, aviation, and climate wellness. We'll also support water resource management uh, related to water quality demand, water quality supply, uh, demand, monitoring aquatic resources in lakes, coastal regions, and also in open oceans. And PACE will advance our understanding of natural uh, disasters with an emphasis on improving response, resilience efforts, and uh, risk assessment and reduction. It would also augment our ability to analyze and forecast uh, changes affecting the Earth ecosystems and will enhance our understanding of climate processes and carb carbon cycling uh, pathways. So stay tuned for the updates near, um, on PACE and be sure to check out the website uh, for PACE uh, listed in the previous slide on uh, specifically if you for looking looking for ways on how to get involved. Now the SBG of our surface biology and geology mission is also in the early stages of development and was uh, selected under the guidance of the 2018 Decadal Survey survey. The um, specifics of SBG are still under development by the ER and but uh, uh, definitely considering hyperspectral and thermal data. And uh, here's some of the parameters that are uh, currently being considered, uh, such as a spectral range from about 350 or 400 to about 2500 nanometers, at a resolution of a spectral resolution of 10 nanometers or, or better with a global uh, <clears throat> data, uh, two to 16 uh, day revisit times. Now the thermal bands in particular um, are, will be somewhere between uh, between uh, 8,000 to 1,200 or, or 3,000 to 500 nanometers. Um, the spectral resolution will be greater than, than the, the, about five bands, so expecting to have more than five bands, and uh, with uh, one to 70 day revisit times, depending on eventually how it is uh, designed. Now, the potential SBG applications include not only vegetation, but also aquatic ecosystems, snow and ice, active geological uh, surface changes, change detection, and natural resource management. And here, this is uh, this figure uh, highlights some of the, the possible applications and what those uh, imagery will eventually look like. Again, similar to PACE, we encourage you to go to the SBG site uh, to get more information about the development of this mission and also how to get involved uh, with it. Now, here's just a summary of what we have talked about today. Um, the uh, hyperspectral visible to shortwave infrared uh, or visual uh, data refers to wavelengths within the visible and infrared portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, um, specifically, we, we, uh, we're we talking about around 380 or 400 nanometers, so about 20 or 2,500 nanometers. Um, the increased spectral resolution from hyperspectral data uh, will provide users with additional uh, data sets that multispectral data cannot measure, as we saw in, in some of the figures. And the campaigns, just as uh, those with the either with the Ivers Classic or the Ivers NG and the Prism, 
uh, will provide us uh, or have been providing us with more hyperspectral data uh, since uh, for for almost a couple of decades already, depending on the sensor. And future hyperspectral missions, such as the um, the Agris 3, um, which is also still in development, and also uh, uh, PACE and surface uh, uh, biology and geology, specifically the last two uh, from space, will provide with uh, different types of hyperspectral data um, that have we have from which we have never had the chance to to, to work with before. Okay, so here are some of the resources uh, for some of the sites that we that we mentioned today. Um, the general sites for airborne science data from NASA, Avrils and Prism sites, the Bioscape campaign, uh, which we'll hear more about in the in the next section, and uh, also the Coral mission and the SPG and PACE uh, missions as well to get more information. Again, as always, uh, here are the uh, contact information, our emails for myself, Amber, Brittany, and Sativa. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, all the materials are available, will be available on the training webpage. And also, uh, we always encourage our participants to go into the General LSEP webpage to get more information about other types of all other types of different, uh, not only upcoming webinars but also uh, webinars that we have done in the past, and as always, all the all those materials are available for our for our public. And also, I uh, would like to encourage you to visit our sister programs uh, of Develop and Servir. Develop is a capacity building program for. Uh, undergrad, recent grad, and grad students on remote sensing. And Serbir is an, our international program that it's in collaboration with USA. And also, uh, feel free to follow us on Twitter at, at, at NASA Arset to also get up to speed on the new or upcoming webinars from our from our Arset uh, program. And with that, let's go now into the Q&A session. Thank you very much. All right, let's go into the uh, Q&A. Um, if uh, Selwyn or any of you guys can share the screen. Oh, there it is. Thank you so much. Um, this is one again, and uh, I'm, I'm also here today not only with my fellow RSET trainers, but also we have a number of uh, panelists as well, um, Just and, and they have been kindly uh, answering some of the questions that, that uh, the audience has posted so far, and we're going to go through some of them, uh, but as I mentioned before, if by any chance there, uh, we, can, we cannot go over your specific question, just because of the limitations of time. Um, this Q&A document will be posted uh, later in the week on the on the training website, and you, you'll have access to, to it uh, with all the questions and, and their specific answers. OK, let's go on to the uh, question number one there. Uh, so when it's uh, in which parts of South America is there average coverage? Is there a viewer where you can Check the geographic coverage. We got a we we got a, quite a few questions uh, asking specific about specific sites um, through this uh, session, and um, uh, I included here again, uh, which is the the data portal for Avris and Avris NG, the, both uh, data portals um, for for these uh, two instruments, and uh, at least until. 2021, there doesn't seem to be uh, data available from for South America in particular. But we we encourage the viewers to check directly with the with the Avris team uh, to verify this. I don't know if any of, of the of our panelists online have a has a, a different or or, or more uh, information about about these about potential data sets from South America.
And remember that these are a lot of these are the airborne, are airborne campaigns or are mission specific, right? So uh, <clears throat> that would uh, that would probably be the, the the reason why. Okay, question number two then. Uh, there's a question about about uh, in slide 21 in particular, uh, why is the data served in JPEG format and this is for illustrative purposes only or uh, should you use a, a dot .data file uh, if you want to get the raw values and, and what is it? Um, yes, they, the JPEGs are usually the um, uh, used as a, what's known as a quick looks uh, to have an idea of, uh, of, uh, of just the, uh, the specific uh, swap that was covered. And uh, but then the researcher can can place a, an order for other types of data sets, and then the data is delivered, auto rectified, calibrated for radiance and atmospherically corrected, uh, uh, usually. And uh, and there's a typically a, a readme file that also comes with the with the data that describes the uh, the, the product uh, details. And uh, and uh, we included here for for average NG in particular. We included here the uh, the website that that uh, talks about all those uh, <clears throat> details in terms of the different data types. Um, and there's a similar one also for for average classic and uh, as well and prism probably. Okay, uh, with average. Are minerals detected on the surface or at a deeper uh, level? Is this information available? I think it was one of our, one of our colleagues here that answered these uh, questions. If you want to, you know, come online and and go through it. Um, if not, I can just read the the answer that was posted here. Hi, Juan. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, this is Leanne Gall from NASA Ames in California. I was the one that um, reached in and answered this question. And it's a really good question. And I wanted to express that <clears throat> Avaris in general has its roots, its beginnings, um, looking at mineralogy. Uh, and so that's um, it's a well-known uh, target for uh, these sensors. And um, there's some amazing and beautiful imagery of mineralogy um, taken by the Avaris sensors. So um, yes, it is surface. Uh, it is, Avaris is a passive sensor, meaning that it collects uh, um, reflected light from the surfaces. Um, however, there is some penetration into the water column and it depends on how clear your water is. Um, and um, you know that's another story to talk about the aquatics, but um, the mineralogy is um, that ability to re do remote sensing mineralogy exploits the, the high spectral range of Avaris data, and it's an excellent target for the Avaris sensors. Um, so that's that's my answer <laughs> for right now. Thanks, Leanne. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good, very good answer. Okay, I think probably you also answered the next one. Uh, it says question four for the biomass estimate in particular. Was it was ground truthing being done? I started to answer that, but I wasn't sure which slide that was referring to. But in general, the uh, Avaris um, and uh, Prism sensors are ground truth. That is something that is um, done on a, you know, it's a critical piece of these airborne campaigns and the ability to do uh, the truthing of the imaging spectroscopy. And what's taken out in the field are um, handheld uh, spectrum, uh, spectral radiometers that have that uh, matching spectral range. And so those are critical pieces for doing that validation. In addition, the um, NASA Jet Propulsion Lab, um, they send out teams that will do um, bright and dark targets to kind of bracket the uh, extent or of, of some of these um, potential targets. And, uh, you know, those are critical. 
and they use uh, validation targets um, uh, globally as well. So there's a series of um, different, uh, like RadCalNet, um, that's another source for um, sites to um, calibrate over to flyover and um, uh, take advantage of. Um, we can probably look those up to give you some links for um, those kinds of sites. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and I also include the link here. Um, I, I, I thought it was most likely when the question came out when we were uh, giving uh, very briefly an example of the uh, Louisiana campaign, uh, the part of the Delta X one. Um, so I included here the link uh, that has uh, more uh, specific information, and uh, and it also has the the paper from uh, from Jensen et al. Uh, that talks about about that campaign and most likely has information about uh, how the gun through thing was was done, and uh, and uh, and also so I want to remind our our, our uh, audience that uh, that we will cover uh, in, especially in sessions maybe in session three and definitely in session four we'll cover more information about how critical it is as Ian mentioned how critical it is to have uh, 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 in situ data field spectroscopy data, particularly during, uh, even, uh, I'm, I'm more, more important for, for aquatic target, targets, even to have it within plus or minus an hour of the overpass uh, to make sure that what, you, what you're grabbing there, or the, the information that you're getting there is, uh, is very much related to what the sensor is also capturing. Okay, uh, number five is PRISM data available. I guess this is one of those uh, that were that asked about the specific data sets for 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 specific con specific countries or regions. Uh, for India, Asia, Europe, are you going to cover how to submit uh, requests? Um, PRISM data has been uh, using and target aquatic uh, environments and has not flown with uh, with average NG in our campaigns. This, this, this depends on the on the aircraft on the platform and uh, a size or you know whether both instruments can even fly together. So so we will need to check on if if uh, on these campaigns if if if, uh, if they flew uh, or not. Okay. So number six uh, there, and can you address the importance of temporal analysis using Earth's observations for biodiversity, as this is a very important part of the analysis? Yeah, um, I don't know what if this was Julian or someone else who answered this uh, question. Yeah, that was with me again. Um, I'm not even caffeinated. I've just gotten kind of excited about these <laughs> excellent questions. <laughs> uh, so, um, so in terms of addressing the importance of uh, temporal analysis um, using Earth observations for biodiversity, this is a really exciting time for that as these hyperspectral um, instruments um, are coming online, but that we've been exploiting the airborne versions through Avaris um, and G more recently, um, and Avaris Classic um, previously, uh, there has been a number of campaigns. So the Hisperi um, airborne campaign in California actually flew from approximately, I wanna say, gosh, 2013 to 2015, and mm -hmm. then uh, kind of transitioned to the Western states um, time series, and that's another uh, link that maybe we could pr put into this answers, uh, both of those to express that. But for just recently, um, there's a, the, the SBG high frequency um, data sampling, or I can't remember, it's called SHIFT, um, time series data collection through with Avaris and G um, over the Santa Barbara area, which covered um, the channel, so aquatics, and uh, primarily the terrestrial, looking at the time series and a frequency of um, what would be good guidance for overpass timing to be able to collect the seasonality 
of the, for example, the vegetation targets. So last year, about this time, they were flying weekly uh, with the hyperspectral sensors being able to capture that. And it's really exciting. There's gonna be a special issue on the uh, shift campaign um, coming out now and they're accepting papers. If any, anybody wants to have access to that data, I think it's available um, and um, can take advantage of maybe writing a paper for that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. And uh, um, so I guess from the, for the, just for the sake of of, uh, of time, we're going to go, going to go over uh, one more or two more and then uh, but just uh, as a reminder, uh, we will definitely cover all of these. We have a, a number of different, really different and very interesting questions, and we'll make sure that we have the, uh, some answer uh, on the final document. Um, there's a question about slides, question seven about uh, slide 39, how much spatial overlap is there between Iris Classic and NG, and uh, to compare a site, for instance, and what is the revisit time, is there's a revisit time? So for some of the US sites in particular, there's some uh, spatial uh, overlap. Um, but as I mentioned, since this are, this are, all of these uh, campaigns are typically mission specific, there's no, no revisit time per se. Uh, airborne campaigns are expensive and, uh, and often uh, campaigns with uh, either average classic or NG can be done at one point in time, um, but uh, but uh, as Liam mentioned uh, in the previous uh, question, there's been some some exciting efforts using uh, Apple's Classic and uh, uh, his very airborne uh, campaign in California covered seasonality over several years uh, over uh, specific targeted uh, flight boxes. So um, we could uh, we could uh, probably include some, some some link here at the end uh, to for our, for the benefit of our of our participants. All right, uh, lastly, are there any hyperspectral data available for the whole planet? So, so far, what uh, at least the, what I know, um, the Hyperion data might be the one, the only one kind of close to, to something like that, but uh, but, uh, but it's, it's limited in terms of the, uh, the uh, temporal, of the, of the timeline of, of, of Hyperion. Um, I did include here. I did include here a, a link to the Hyperion data portal. Uh, so who, who the, our, the participant who, who asked about this specific uh, question, uh, feel free to to check on this link and uh, to explore your region of interest and uh, explore if there's a if there's data available for for that particular site. Okay. Uh, yeah, so like I said, because of the limitations of time, we're gonna stop here, but uh, we will cover all these questions in the final document. I wanna, again, uh, thank you all for uh, being here with us today. Uh, obviously stay tuned for um, Wednesday for the session two of this uh, uh, webinar series, where we are going to cover two different instruments, uh, uh, Hytes and also uh, Elvis, and we will also have uh, our special uh, uh, invited speaker, uh, Dr. Adam Wilson, who will talk a little bit about the Bioscape campaign. So uh, stay tuned for uh, the next session uh, this Wednesday, and have a great day. Thank you very much.